I am unashamed. What about you? All right, we're back. We got Zach back again. Zach, what have you been doing? I've been uh, I've been raising kids. You know we're adopting, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. That's awesome. Tell us tell us about that. Yeah, we uh, we met this um, young lady. Um, well, I guess it's been about f- three or four, four or five months ago, and um, she. Some lady had called Jill, my wife, who is on the the board here at the children's home because she had a friend of, of hers that was considering terminating her pregnancy and was just, what do I say to this girl? She's wanting, you know, she's looking into uh, trying to figure out what she's going to do, trying to get this money for it. And Jill's like, well, tell her that we'll adopt the baby. Uh, th- now, we, me and Jill had already talked about this. I, I told her, look, if the if the Lord drops a baby on our doorstep, then then I'll adopt. And so, he, so he did. So we uh, we started walking with the mom. We got to meet her, and um, and developed a relationship there. And um, make a long story short, we we uh, the baby was born at 27 weeks, and it's oh, in wow. the, the NICU unit. Yeah, so she's she's been in for. She was born on Easter. So there, there's a whole story behind it that I'll. I'll, I'll tell you guys at one at someday, but it's because it is incredible. But but this week, uh, Fred, my youngest, until the last baby was born, um, I get a call from the neighbor because I'm 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 stay at home dad because Jill's in the NICU with the baby, so I'm having to yeah. watch all the kids, try to work, try. To, it's it's been it's been insane. So so Fred, um, he he I get a call from the neighbor. The the uh, there's a bed and breakfast right next door to my house. And he says, "Have you seen Fred?" He said he had a paper cut. About and that how time, old Fred, is Fred walks in the house. Fred, Fred is ten years old. He's okay. ten. So, he's, so he goes next door because he gets a paper cut and asks them to doctor up the paper cut. Well, when he walks to the door, he's got blood. I mean, it's it's everywhere, and he's. <laughs> I mean, he's got a gash on his thumb that's about two inches deep. I mean, he's cut this thing. He's out there in the shop trying to sharpen a knife, which he didn't know how to do it, and he's coming back towards him. So he hits his thumb, but but instead of coming to tell me, he goes next door to the to the guy that owns the the bed and breakfast and says, Hey, you guys help me out. I got a little paper cut here. Of course the guy's <laughs> like, That's more than a paper cut, son. I better call your dad. Yeah. So that that's been my life for the last uh six weeks is raising kids uh, I, I never appreciated how much my wife had, did until until the last four weeks. Oh yeah, but that's that's what I've been up to. You know what I've noticed every time I hear a kid story of me from having, I guess four, is that they do not want to disappoint. The fear of disappointment outweighs everything, which is probably yeah. he went to the neighbor because he didn't want to say, you know, I about cut my thumb off. Well, I'd already told him not to. I I told him that you don't play with a knife like that. So he'd already he's out there on a. Uh, he's also getting on the the grinder out in my shop. I mean, he's these kids like they have no. They're feral. They're feral kids. It was more about disobedience, <laughs> Chase. That's what it was about. But that's what we did. I mean, Which, you learn. You just hope you can survive the learning process. Well, you know, last week we were talking about, and even in the book of Romans, we were when we were talking about that term, the obedience of faith on the last episode, that that's that's what made me think of it with your kids. Like they, when they're at 10 years old, they, my kids obey me sometimes, most of the time when, but they do it out of this obligatory, they don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. So it's all based in fear. And that's why I think that that term we talked about last week is so important because it's I think what Paul's doing in the Book of Romans is he's he's calling us to a new type of obedience. <clears throat> yeah. Now, now when I tell Bear, hey Fred, uh, you know when you when you sharpen a knife, you don't go backwards. Now he he actually I think I gained some credibility with him, so I think he's going to be obeying me more more out of faith now. When I was ten years old, three of my buddies we gathered in a circle, and one of them said, "Let's play this this." game i can't remember the name of it but you basically we all had pocket knives you would throw the knife in between your buddy's feet and you couldn't you got points based on if if it if it was outside the toes or outside the heels you got no points so you had to put it 
in between the person's feet. Well, that was great until one of the pocket knives went right in between the big toe and the toe next to it. Just, I mean, mm. and then you realize in that moment, why, why, why am I playing this? <laughs> but you don't go tell your parents because they'll be like, "What are you? What are you stupid?" <laughs> so yeah, I remember that because the guy who got the knife through the toes, the other guy said, "I guess that means you lose." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 y'all need to do a Matt Dillon episode. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yeah, I don't know what that means. But well, Matt Dillon, don't they do that? Oh, do they? Oh, they uh, play that game. What is it well, called? That, we need that, a name for that it's, game. It's it's, but it's usually with guns, but uh, yeah. probably sometimes with knives. But uh, Matt yeah. always steps in and he dealt with every human sin that there is to deal with, and and he dealt dealt with them harshly, swiftly. But he was fair minded. Good did always triumph over evil. That's why I carry my happiness. Is watching gun smoke over yeah. and over and over again. That's top five greatest <laughs> gifts. I'm in Zach Dillon. Zach, to your spiritual point, though, I love verse 17 of Romans 1 because no matter how well we think about ourselves, and we, we all have this fear of disappointing others, and so we. We, you know, we lie, we, we try to come across, especially in the social media world, we try to be a better version of ourselves. You know, God makes it clear through Paul's writings, you know, in the gospel, which we talked about last time, which is who Jesus is and what he, what he did, what he does and what he is going to do. Plus because a righteousness from God is revealed. But it's from God. It The righteousness is from God. Well, if the righteousness that comes through the gospel into our lives, if it's from God, why, why are we trying to take the credit for it or, or trying to earn somehow, you know, our obedience is a response. It's not a righteousness that's coming from us. He, right. he provided yeah. the way for righteousness to be obtained through a person. And we're accepting it by faith and our obedience to the one who did this for us. Our obedience becomes front and center because we're no longer under law, but well, we're, right. we're, but we're on the grace. By the way, Jace, I'm going to share something with you. Let's see. You're about, how old are you now? Let's just not bring it up. I'm old. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I don't like I numbers. ran up on something the other day, and it comes back to the book of Romans or the rest of the epistles as far as the gospel is concerned. When the Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians, with, with Romans 1 in mind, the gospel is mentioned about eight or nine times in the first section. Well, then it dramatically makes a hard turn, and it deals with people from 118 Chapter 1, verse 18, for our listeners, from there till about chapter 3, verse 21, it's called by some the doctrine of, of, of condemnation. He goes from the wonderful uh, thing God yeah, has done. The blessing for, of Jesus. Oh, and, and for the, yeah. When you first start reading, you say, man, this is it. Well, and then he says, here's the people who have not heard this nor obeyed it, and there is no Jesus there, and there is no gospel. Well, he outlines them three groups. He starts with the just rank heathen. Then he talks to the ones who want to go around canceling everybody else because they're not as bad as they are. But, you know, they forget their own sins, and they, they, they pass judgment on others. He deals with them, and then he deals with the Jews in the book yeah. of Romans. But I just run mm -hmm. up on this the other day, Zach, and this is interesting. I, I would bet y'all have never thought about this. I've been reading my Bible, uh, what, what would I say, religiously for the last 45, 50 years. But I ran into this the other day, and I was shocked. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, now watch this as far as being redundant. This is verse 3. 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father, so this is the one through whom the gospel came to us by his son becoming flesh, dying, being buried, and raised from the dead. Watch this. Our Father, God, is the Father of compassion, and check this out, and the God of all comfort. So you say, compassion and comfort. Now watch this. Comfort, that's one. Who comforts us, that's two, and all our troubles so that we can comfort, three, those in any trouble with the comfort, four, we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort, five, overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort, six, and salvation, if we are comforted, seven, it is for your comfort, eight, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. He's, he's plowing ground and reminding the Corinthians, look, once you come to a knowledge of the truth, Jesus, him being crucified and raised from the dead, and your obedience comes out of that from your faith, God's going to comfort you. And he's going to make sure you understand he had great compassion on you. Our Good hope point. for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, sufferings so also you share in our comfort. Well, yeah. you say, I'm, I never had noticed and I never had attributed the God of heaven being the God of compassion and comfort. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you say something wow. eight times— in a in a space about that 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 much in seven verses, and he's writing down what God told him to write down. And you look at that, you say, you know, I never had read that much about comfort until I got the second. But you Corinthians think how chapter. how valuable comfort, it's amazing comfort is. What what will people do to be comfortable? Oh, I mean, I think there's a hotel chain called the Comfort wow. Inn. There's you know, a give us mass, your money, there's and a we'll mass, provide comfort. There's a mass of humanity, humanity uh, Zach, and all they're looking for is comfort. But I'm here to tell them you're looking in the wrong place. You come to Jesus, mm. and you will be under the shadowy, the wings of the God, the Father mm. of compassion and comfort. I like that, Zach. Yeah, I do too. To me, that is that is. Yeah, that's good. Let's let's uh, let's take a quick break. Jay, so you, uh, with your daughter graduating next year, are you going to sell your house in mm-hmm. Austin? What's the What's the plan? Y- yes. You want to buy it? No, well, no, I don't. <laughs> but I, I'll give you a deal. You give me a deal? Well, I might buy it if you give me a deal. You know? Yeah. But I've heard the Austin market is on fire. So. It's on fire. Well, I've been I've been uh, buying a few properties up here, flipping them. Um, and so I went and I, I checked my credit score because apparently if you have over 710 on your credit score, you get a much lower interest rate. And so I wanted to make sure I was maximizing my interest rate. And so I, I remembered, hey, ScoreMaster, one of our, our best um, uh, sponsors, I, I went on there, I set my account up. It took just, a, I mean, literally took like, a couple minutes and then it runs your credit score and it tells you where you're at but then also tells you um, how you can increase your score so i i basically did that and did everything that they told me to do because my score was under 710 for some reason within uh, 30 days my my score had jumped from from 690 points to, to 810 um, which saved me quite a bit of money on uh, my, my interest rate um, for the, the loan that I bought. In fact, average American has 97 points they can add to their credit score, but they just have no idea how to get there. The average score master user raises their credit score 61 points in just 20 days. For me, it was a lot more. Um, I don't know what yours will be, but, uh, but score master puts you in control of your finances, not the banks. Enrollment takes just a few minutes, so visit scoremaster.com. 
slash Phil. That's scoremaster.com slash Phil. Yeah, I, I love that, Phil, because I think what you've described is the essence of, of a person who who obeys their father out of faith versus one who is doing it out of works because it's not it, it, we yeah, have you're to, never going to be comforted by it. works you're never going to reach it with no nope. well, well let me say this Zach. uh it it because people ask us how you study the bible and how do you come up with these points and how do you remember the bible because you're going to apply to what phil just said but i just to go along with how romans is laid out when phil brought up those the first three chapters being like ooh, it's actually from Romans 1 17, there's there's a segue which I which I read. The gospel through the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. That yeah. is by faith, you know, not by works, which is, which is what we imply. But then in Romans 3 and verse 21, because from Romans 1 18 to Romans 3 20, it it's is brutal. It's brutal. But in 21, look, he says he's, he's the, like he says that. the same thing that he says in Romans 1, 17. If you read Romans 1, 17, and then you read Romans 3, 21, it says, but now, which I remember when I when I was learning Romans in at the school when we were there. This is a relief verse. Oh, it was like, <laughs> you're talking about comfort. I'm like, if Romans Woo. 3, 21 hadn't have come any sooner... Because I was getting uncomfortable oh. from one Romans 1.18 uh-huh. to 3.20. It says, but now, and he says the same thing, a righteousness from God. It's not on this, this human merit. And that next uh, statement is the one. Uh, apart from law, which has be, been made known to which the law and prophets testify, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe, which is why he said the gospel 17, 17 times in the first chapter. I just wanted to to lay that out. If you're studying the book, you had those two transi- transitional moments from the, you know, you have the good news. Then here's the facts about your life outside of a righteousness from God being revealed. If you turn that down. This is what you have, which is a lot of chaos and evil behavior, and yeah. a lot of a lot of prejudice at, of, of groups of people. Because through that, all this chaos going on, he he comes up with that line: "God doesn't show favoritism," because he basically said, "No matter what you've done, and here's a list of things that we do. Yep. I'm here to bring you righteousness. There's a better way because of." Compassion and comfort that comes through Jesus, and, mercy, and, and what He did. Grace. I just wanted to clarify that for you. Explained it, just how that ties in with Rome, how Romans is laid out. Well, it does tie in because I think that um, I was, you know, I was reading a book um, the other day. Uh, this author I'd heard of, oh, actually, it's been several years, and I'd heard about this author, and everybody was talking about how incredible this book was, and so. Out of curiosity, I went and I got the book, and I mean it was everywhere. I kept hearing about it, and I start reading it, and it's like a kind of a kind of a Christian book, more like a self help book. I get about six chapters in, and I'm like, this is the worst news I have ever heard about how to get right with anything, because her basic premise was you you got to grind it out and pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and and, that, and she's basically saying that's what I did, and that's why I'm amazing. And I'm reading this thinking, I know who I am. I know who I really am in my heart. And I think most people are struggling with living the godly life because they know in the back of their mind, they really know what they are. They, we, I think we really know how evil we are and what we're capable of. And the reason why I love what you just said about, about Romans uh, up to Romans 3 is because what Paul's doing is he, it's an indictment. It's an indictment that pretty much put, not pretty much, it puts everybody in the same bucket of the condemned. And while that may be not popular in today's culture, it is it is reality. And when I talk about this idea of obeying God out of faith, I think what that means is is that's that that's approaching the subject believing that God is not just powerful 
but it's also believing that God is good. It's believing that God has your best interest at heart. It's believing that when God reveals something to you, that it's for your your benefit. And and I can obey that in a in a in a, in a greater measure than I can if if I'm just obeying you because you're more powerful than me. Then guess what I'm going to do when you turn your head? I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah. But that's not the kind of obedience that God wants. That's why that's why this isn't about power. God could God could crack open the sky and stick his face out and say, "Hey, boys." Everybody get on your knees right now, and everybody's going to get on their knee. Why? Even Satan himself, Philippians 2 says that. He's calling us to something different. He's calling us to a relationship with him. He's calling us to a different type of obedience that says, I'm going to actually obey you, God, because I believe that whatever you're telling me, that you've got a vantage point that I can't understand, but I know you're big, and I know you're good, and I can submit myself to that. That's a different type of obedience where you can have real victory. Well, I do think it's about power. It's just a different understanding of what true power is. I mean, correct. People don't think forgiveness is powerful. It's you know, one of the most powerful things on the but earth. A lot of people look at that if you forgive someone and they're like, oh, what a weak response. Because we like having that bitterness and that battle and, and that war. and Like the Apostle Paul said, my power is made known, Jesus told him, through weakness. I mean, look, we just don't yeah. think about our, that's why I brought up, you know, when we're kids, you don't want to disappoint people. But even when we're adults, we don't, we, we don't want to disappoint. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be viewed as weak. I mean, I was playing cards with my buddies the other night, and uh, one of the guys, he's a big old fella, and he, he told me one of the funniest stories I've ever heard in my life. And, I mean, it just happened. And you're like, how do, how do we get ourselves in this situation? But he was talking about, he was so embarrassed. He just, he, what, what, he was at a Mexican restaurant and he, they started eating. He's with his family. It's crowded wall to wall people. And he gets like three bites in it and a pain hits him. And he's like, I gotta go to the bathroom. So he, but he kind of did it clumsily because it was like, where's the bathroom right now? One of these moments. So he goes in there, takes care of his business where he looks around, well, there's no toilet paper. So he texts his wife and says, there's no toilet paper in this bathroom. And so she goes to, you know, the manager or whatever and says, there's no toilet paper. And she's kind of upset about how do how do you have a, you know, a bathroom and no toilet paper. <laughs> So this is where it went off the rails because she's on the phone with him and they're talking. Well, one of the employees comes out and they have the eternal roll, industrial size roll of toilet paper, but she's carrying it on her shoulder. Well, now everybody's noticing this thing come across the restaurant headed toward the bathroom. So everybody's kind of laughing like, what do we got going on in here? It doesn't sound like it ended well. And he's like, I'm, here I am, you know, the commode, sweat pouring, and I'm embarrassed. <laughs> and he's like, I know that everybody now is watching. Their eyes are fixed on what has happened here and who's going to come out. And he's a big guy already. And he's like, I found myself. <laughs> I did not want to go out. I thought, I can't face this. <laughs> we all got so tickled because he was like, but I got to be the chump and walk around. And he said, I realized everybody was thinking, the last thing you want to do right now is follow that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I just thought, isn't that our yeah. human nature? I mean, what turned out to be, you know, let's take the wife out is now – miserable because we don't like those eyes on us. We don't want to be vulnerable and be viewed in, in compromising situations. And you fast forward that to our spiritual life. That's why we deny. That's why we lie. That's why we cover up because we want people to think we're the greatest thing on earth. We're, we're God's gift to the earth, yep. not God's gift, you know, in Jesus mm. and that righteousness being revealed in, in him. You know, despite our weakness, embarrassment, and bad decisions. Let's take a break. Well, that's certainly the avenue that Paul took. I mean, that's the approach he took. As a, he starts off saying, Paul, a bondservant 
of Christ Jesus. So he's obviously keeping the central, centrality of Christ. He's putting himself as a bond servant. I think Paul got it. I yeah. think because Paul understood as he's writing this, I mean, obviously he he wrote the whole book, so he knows he knows what the end's going to be while he's writing this and has it in mind. As as readers, though, we're we're we don't we're we're, we're kind of reading this argument as it unfolds. But um, but when he says that, I think that that ver- that first verse when he calls himself a bond servant of Christ Jesus, that's what allows him to say verse fourteen right before he in fifteen before he gets into the theme of Romans, which is. Uh, that I'm under obligation, verse 14, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, he says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. In other words, Paul's saying, yeah. look, like I'm this thing is opened up for everybody because everybody, starting with himself, is completely flawed. We know what, we know what he's going to get to in Romans 7, where he's going to kind of spill out his own internal dilemma. Um I think this is so relevant, guys, for where we're at culturally right now because we're being pitted against one another based on uh, race, gender, politics, all this stuff that's happening right now where we're we're being pit against one another. When really, I think this is a relevant message because it yeah. it really it, it really does put everybody in the same exact boat. By yeah. the way, as far as the gospel is concerned, yesterday, uh, I think Sis Strunk, one of our brothers. It was about one, two, three, four. It was about four or five last week, four or five this week. And they say they're coming because of this podcast. They heard about the gospel. And I, and I, nearly all of them say what you say, Jace. You know what they say? What's it? I've never heard that before. Never heard it before. And I, they watch the podcast. They drive to West Monroe, Louisiana, Monroe up here. Mm. And Sunday morning is where we meet them. They don't hear it because they're focusing on the obedience, you know, the rule keeping, what they view. Legalism. Uh, yeah, of, of well, even if people are preaching Jesus, somehow or another there's a detachment. And look, you see it just in the way we say things. I'll give you an example. This is one of a pet peeve of mine. You know, a lot of people, they'll say, we need to go out there and, and, witness or they say i witnessed to someone and i always found that i I found that always uh intriguing i was like what what do they mean by that and so when i studied the bible i realized that when when god told i mean when jesus told his disciples you know you will be my witnesses you know in acts one when he said that to start in here in jerusalem and all and we kind of picked up on that and said well when you tell people about jesus you know, that's your witness. And the reason I'm saying this is a pet peeve of mine is because it it we've gone so far away from that where it's like something that we're doing. And by contrast, to prove my point, Paul's perspective was the exact opposite. And I'll give you an example. When he, he said in Romans 1, 9, he's already said what he's about, the gospel who Jesus is. Then he says, God, whom I serve with my whole heart, which I like that he just, he clarified his whole heart. I mean, this is everything I got. In preaching the gospel of his son, which what, what, that's what we would call witnessing, right? He's preaching the gospel. But watch what he said. Is my witness. He, he had a perspective of that, God is my witness on what's going on in praying for you and how I I feel about it. And I think it's just an attitude and a perspective that God is where all the righteousness is coming from. God is providing all the Mm -hmm. motivation. God is my character witness, and he knows that on my own it's not good. But he knows that I love you. Let me bring up my witness God Almighty. Mm. Most people, the last thing they would want to do in any situation is bring for a character witness the God of the universe. That's the last person they're thinking. Because you know why? Because he knows what's really going on. He mentioned in the book of Acts, by the way. Hold on, Phil. Let's take a quick break. Yeah, he mentioned in the book of Acts, Jace, remember? And he said, and he could have said it here, but he just flipped it. But 
because he was a witness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, who are you? You know, what are you, what? Well, that is the point. That was my point. These guys were eyewitnesses to what's going on. But from but we take that in the religious world and we come up with things that doesn't really make sense. But it and it detaches us from that this is God working his his power in us despite our flaws. The power's coming from him. The righteousness is coming from him. That's why when people come and they say are you saying that this particular sin, they'll pick something out. Are you saying that that's wrong or that's a sin? I'm like, that's God's business. I'm here introducing you to Jesus because maybe that will provide the platform for you to make better decisions and to figure out right and wrong. But it, you you got this on me, which would be a mistake. They diligently study the scriptures because they think by them they'll be saved. But the scriptures, Jesus uh-huh. said, are talking about me. Yeah, John 5. And you refuse to come it. to me. You see yeah, what I'm saying? I love it. I bring that scripture up at least once a week in some context. Well, yeah, that's the it's the it's the personification of Jesus. It's not we're not converting people to the gospel. We're, we're the gospel is bringing them to Jesus. It's that, a person. That's yeah, right. He it, is we, the we, God. Yeah, he said that over and yeah. over, Zach. Yeah, it's it's I, th- I think that's what it is though. I think that when you're kind of what you're describing, Jace, is that you keep saying it in different ways, but basically what you're saying is all of this originates with with God, not us. Our our obedience, our righteousness, our it's it's all being revealed from God. He's revealing His triune nature, which is by the way beautiful, and it's that revelation that leads man to do anything good. Left to our own vices, we're we're as we're going to find out in Romans three, we're. We're pretty jacked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Romans 1 is a brutal reading after when he says, for God reveals the righteousness. But then it's like, but you you neither, how does it say? But And then it says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Well, people zero in on that, and they're like, well, I thought he was revealing righteousness. How come he's revealing wrath? But he makes it real clear that he doesn't want to do that. That's right. But then it gets into men, look, suppressing the truth by their wickedness. They claim to be wise, but have become fools. For although they know God, like 21, they don't glorify him as God, nor give thanks to him. So if you abandon God, there's there's consequences because all of the righteousness and all of the compassion and all the comfort that we've talked about that's being revealed. Once you say, you know what, I'm good. As in, you know, you know, I'm good. No, really. They're like, yep. here, here, look at what God's done for you. No, I'm good. I don't need that. I'm good. You, you go ahead and do do your little gospel thing. You think about the the difference between what you're talking about here. These these uh, Romans sixteen. 17, uh, uh, let's see here, they have 16 and 17, which, by the way, the, the entire podcast, th- this is our theme verse. This is, right. uh, verse 16 is the verse that we actually did the trailer on. It's where the, the name came from when I was thinking about what it would be a good name for a podcast with Phil, Jason, Al. And I thought about the way y'all live your life. I thought about the many, many conversations I've watched around your living room and the one, I mean, th- this is, th- I would say this is, it, this is definitely the theme verse of the book of Romans. I would say it's the theme verse for, for you guys, your life, which is what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And so that first section right there is God is saying, I'm bringing salvation and righteousness. How? How's he doing it? By God coming to live with us. It's God's yep. presence coming with us. And so when you turn to verse 18 and he flips, now he's not revealing righteousness. What's he revealing now? He's revealing wrath. Well, what is the wrath of God that's being revealed? As we're going to see, probably, we probably get into this next time, but um, what, what it is, it's God saying, okay, I'm going to back off. I'm going to yeah. remove my presence, and I'm going to let you do what you want to do. And yeah. when you start looking at it in that context, 
it, it gets you out of these conversations like, well, is this a sin? Is that a sin? Well, what, how, how far can I go? Well, what, what's the line I can walk to? Like, you've already missed it. If you're asking yeah. those kind of questions, you've already missed it. The, the real question is, are you in the presence of God? Or are you out of the presence of God? If you're out of yeah. his presence, it's because he's, he's, he's pouring wrath out on you. You don't want to be well, out of his right. presence. But, you know, that's why I look. Uh, the reason I'm unashamed to go back to the witness point is that I believe that God is watching me. I believe he's real and witnessing my life. Yes. So I'm unashamed. Hold that, thought. Hold, hold that thought, Jace. Let's take a quick break. So we're watching. I mean, I believe he's watching me. And so here's a, and I believe that God works in us to reveal Jesus, just like he did with Paul in this context. And so here I am in a situation where I have an opportunity. I'm no matter what happens, I feel like if I, if I'm ashamed of him, what, what's he thinking in that moment? So, I mean, you think, what do you do? You gulp. And you say, God is my witness, and you declare. God made God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's that's second that's, mm. that's second uh, Corinthians about verse five, chapter five, about verse. 10 and later, but uh, that pretty well is yeah, Romans good. 1 16 over again. Yeah, that's good. Jace, when, when you said that, I was thinking about a A.W. Tozier quote that I heard in a sermon that he gave uh, many, many years ago. Uh, and I'm going to butcher the quote, but he, he essentially asked, the, he says this, he says, it's not about what I think of God, but what does he think of me? And I think that what we would do really good in, in, in Western culture, if, particularly in the church, is to get away from a me-centric gospel. I, I, we obviously are part of the gospel because we're the recipients of it, um, and we're not going full Gnosticism, but but we I think we've left the centrality of Jesus, the verse you read, Phil, in Him. God made Him who had no sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness right. of God, not not in our own. It, it's he, the, he is the... He's self-referential. He's the originator of all of this. Yep. I think we got to return to a reverence for the holy of holies. We we have to understand that we are talking about the Creator of all things, who is who is uh, in all. He, he is Omega. He is Alpha. He is beginning in. I mean, we're talking about the Great I Am, who refers to Himself not in a temporal form. You know the story of Exodus. Yep. Whenever Abraham says, "Well, who are you?" He, he didn't. He he says, "I am." You tell him I am since you. Yeah. That's the guy we're talking about. You well, betcha. it reminded me of the verse I read a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the overview of Romans, because look, at Romans one sixteen, it is, you know, our theme that we're unashamed, and we're unashamed because we believe God is real and he does witness and he does watch us. But it goes back to we believe also that Jesus, when he was here on the earth, he had us in mind. The whole reason he led his life, he went to a cross and he came back. Because he he was, this was something a real being motivated because of his love for us, and he said in Luke nine twenty five, "What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory." I mean, really, this is a theme that he announced. And it's pretty simplistic if you think about it. When you're in these situations in the world where you're trying to be something you're not or to gain some wealth or power, worldly power, and you're willing to give up your relationship with God and anything else that gets in the way, I mean, when you think about the end of that, what will you gain? Yeah. You Peter, will gain nothing. Yeah. Peter had it right when he mentioned the gospel on how powerful it is, and we cover this in the book of Acts. He said, you handed him, Jesus, over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. 
You disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. Now check this out in verse 15. This is Acts chapter 3, about 15. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. The author of life, and he got there by dying, and three days later, holding out his hands and showing him his feet, saying, what about it, boys? What about it? Mm. So it's the greatest event that ever happened in human history. The greatest is the gospel of Jesus, what went down right there. Three days, God solved yeah. the whole, entire problem and the predicament mankind has put himself in. But, you know, they, they, Amen. He, he puts his wrath out on them because of it. And that's Romans 1, 18. But, but think about say, it. Philly. He solved the whole thing yeah. in three days? But if you read Romans 1, 18 through chapter 3, 20, or you preached on that, or you heard a steady diet of those sermons, that would be depressing. Oh, it's very hard to go to the book of Romans and try to pick out a section and preach on it. If you miss that first chapter before he got to Romans one, you are correct. And then the, but now in, in three twenty one, which I think is very important and a, and a, and a key point because as bad as this stuff seems, I mean, cause we get into this, uh, you know, the same sex attraction and cause all of this starts in Romans one where, where, you know, it comes up to that. They say, forget God. He brings up the idea that everyone's without excuse because of his eternal power and divine nature. I mean, in redneck terms, you can look around and say there is a God. And then all of a sudden relationships crumble. They get their priorities out of whack. God, people, animals, and they start following a lie instead of the truth. And you see in verse 24, it says, So God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts degrade to sex and impurity, degrading their bodies one with another. Uh, and then in verse 26, it gets into even the women exchange natural relations for unnatural. 27, in the same way, men abandoned natural uh, relations with women were inflamed with lust one another received in themselves the penalty. And then all of a sudden there's this huge list. They've become filled with wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, murder, strife, envy, malice, God haters, slanders, arrogant. So my point is people go in, in religious establishments and they preach these sermons that these things are wrong. But if you, if you don't recognize the motivation for how you get there or the, the, the lack of concern for who God is, you kind of figure that there's no way out. Then it just turns into de a debate. And I think this is wrong and, and you don't. It's behavior modification. That's why That's verse right. 28 is key. And just as they did not see it fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what, to do things which are not proper and then he lists all the things that we usually preach about as being sins, which they are, you know, uh, unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, envy, murder, strife, uh, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. The, but all of those things are the result of God saying, I'm giving you over to yourself. The point is not don't do these things. That's not the point of Romans, Romans one. The point yeah. is this are these, are the, this is what life looks like when God says, okay, I'm out. You, you, I'm giving you over to yourself. That's that, that's a big motivation change because now we got to get out of this like behavior modification stuff where we're telling people, Hey, don't do the bad things. No, it's not about that. He's wants obedience of faith. God's saying, I am the way to life. You, if you dwell in me, this is not the life that you'll live. You're going to live a life of holiness. You're, uh, Galatians right. chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. It's the opposite of this Mad Max world that's that's kind of 
you know, pulled out here in Romans chapter one. Exactly. But, That's why when someone comes to ask, and they ask me a question about one of these sins or because, you know, we hear this thousands of times. They're like, is this a sin? And how do you feel about that? I'm like, why well, introduce them to Jesus? If you ever see uh, these qualities attributed to a human being, they are senseless. Mm -hmm. Think about an individual being senseless, faithless, heartless, and mm. ruthless. You're like, Ew. do what? That's the four less things that you don't want to be a part of. <laughs> but but my, my point is, are, are we going to stand up in a pulpit and rail that all these things are wrong? Are we going to introduce Jesus and let that be the foundation for which you make better decisions? You can't, you can't attack the results of a life without God without offering the solution, which he made it really clear in chapter 1, verse 1 through 17 on what the solution is. Zach had it right. And, and you, there's no obedience and a holy lifestyle living a righteous life. That's not there when it's void of faith. I mean... Yeah unbelief and you say here's here's what you look like that romans 1 18 and follow and you're like here's here's a glimpse of what you're like mm -hmm. it's a brutal read because what because ultimately i think the, the foundation of romans 1 uh is you know in theological terms in seminary they would teach you that there that god reveals himself in two ways there's general revelation which is what it's talking about here this is god is revealing himself through creation I may not know that God's triune. I may not know that his son is Jesus. I may not know any of that stuff that's revealed in Scripture. That, that's special revelation. But, but generally, I know that God's there. Anybody in their right mind knows that when they walk outside and they just look around at what's been made. And, and, and what, 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 what the sin is, the cardinal sin here is, is this, that they exchanged, verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals craw and crawling creatures. We, they, they chose to worship the things of God rather than the God who made the things. That's now, correct. we would never do That's that. We, we, would never worship, we would never worship images in 2021. We, huh. we wouldn't worship images on a phone or on... <laughs> but, but that's what we're doing now, right? We're yeah. worshiping Instagram. We're worshiping the images that are on our social media apps, and we're worshiping avatars. And, and, and this has become this where we get our morality from. I, so the, the, the key is, is to, for the believer is to flip back to who who is the originator of all things. If you, worship, right. if you worship created things more than the creator, you're you're doomed for a hellish life on planet Earth is all I can It's say. a really good question in any kind of situation about life is you say, is it created? You know, when people say, I got problems, you know, and I was like, are all the things that you're, that's causing you problems, are these created things? Yeah. People, yeah. they're thinking, you know, what, what's he talking about? Because you have two categories here, which he does a really good job, I guess, you know, since he is God through his spirit. So he does a really good job explaining this because he's like, you have the creation and you have the creator. Choose wisely. Yep. Uh, on what you're trying mm. to obtain. Then he's got, then he goes on Zach to reiterate your point and says, they exchanged the truth of God for Allah. So it's, it's not just the created things rather than the creator. You now have truth that goes with the creator versus the lie. The created thing is the lie. If you're putting your faith and trust in your social media account, which are all created things and images well you're going to be disappointed number one <laughs> plus they're going to save the planet jace yeah save the cosmos this was so funny when i see these people that become so obsessed with how many people like them on social media and you talk about a lie because they just created a button that you push you're a million miles away and you don't even have to be a real person you can actually just be a robot created by somebody a created thing that says, I like you. And you're like, if you put your faith and trust, because I've met people who are obsessed 
and have attached their worth monetarily and just their feeling about life on how many people follow and like them. Huh. Mm-hmm. Now that would be a lie. You, you, you're headed that's, toward. That's a lie. <laughs> that's a lie. That's not going to work. Out, that's not going to work out well for you. Well, we're about out of time here, so um, I think we'll be back next time. Al is going to be up here with me, so we're going to. Uh, you think be up we'll here be back North next Carolina. time? Or are we coming back? I mean, what? Unless the Lord comes back, you said I think we'll yeah, be yeah, back. I, you, you, well, I, yeah, you don't know when he's coming back, Jace. I don't make predictions about the oh, future. I thought somebody was fixing to I get just fired. Think, yeah. <laughs> not, not everybody's good. Lord willing, we'll be back and and uh, next time with Al in in the studio up here and you guys down there. So, thank y'all for joining us. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes, and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else. Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.